Hi, Jeff Spira here again. And today I want to talk to you about a voyage that happened in 564 AD. Well, at least that's when they think it started, anyway. And it's called the Voyage of St. Brendan the Abbot. Um, now, at the, at the time of Columbus, many contemporary maps of that time showed an island west of Europe across the Atlantic Ocean called St. Brendan's Isle. Um, you know, map makers disagreed on, on its exact location and exactly what it looked like. It, and it showed it at differences uh, in various differences in distance from Europe and, and different latitudes and such. But um, a book written in Latin and copied in many monaster, monasteries in Europe, originally dated in the 9th century, um, entitled Navigito Santi Bernardi Abetus, which is the voyage of St. Brendan the Abbot in Latin. So that was uh, copied you know, many times uh, going back many, many years in Europe. And it describes a voyage taking place in the 6th century, which would have been the 500 ADs, where St. Brendan discovered a new land across the ocean. That was a well-known and accepted piece of folklore in medieval Europe. So um, whether Columbus ever heard or read the story is unknown, but it would seem unlikely that he somehow missed it since Columbus was a skilled researcher. And uh, with St. Brendan's Isle on many of his maps, it's, it's hard to imagine he just simply disregarded the accounts of the voyage. So, um, St. Brennan was a known historical figure. He was born, born in County Kerry in Ireland in 484 AD. So after being ordained, uh, St. Brennan traveled extensively around Northwest Europe, founding monasteries and spreading Christianity. Um, most agreed he sailed to Scotland and Wales and probably have visited some of the Norse lands. Um, he lived to the ripe old age of 93 and was buried in Clonfert Monastery in County Galway, Ireland in 577 AD. Um, he founded a monastery there in 559 AD and it's still there today. So it's, he was a real person. So. The 9th century book described the voyage of St. Brendan at that time already in his early 70s making a voyage in a skin-covered boat called a curragh. This type of boat is still being made today in Ireland, along with uh, 13 fellow monks. Um, he took off, and um, he believed that another monk named St. Finbar had made the journey before him, but it's difficult to figure out who St. Finbar was, since there's uh, it was very common uh, in that era, and there were you know, five St. Finbars identified in the Irish history. So anyway, they sailed looking for a promised land and were gone for 14 years, returning with stories of adventures. So just from some of the descriptions of the Isles and location, it strongly suggests he did make a journey since the locals and descriptions can be uh, associated with actual places. So the journey begins with St. Brendan and his companions heading northward from Ireland. After a day's sailing, they came to a rocky isle with no landing place. So after circumventing, circumnavigating the isle, they discovered a small cove where they anchored and went ashore. So this is clearly a description of the island of St. Kildas. It's uh, from an archipelago 45 north miles northwest of Hebrides, that matches almost exactly the description in the ninth century text. So this is a real place, um, St. Kildas. So St. Brandon uh, voyage uh, continued to another island where there were many sheep and they discovered Irish monks living there. So um, part of the description of this place, this next place that uh, St. Brandon landed was that it was a bird paradise. Um, so it's, it's, Probably um, a description of uh, the Faroes, Faroe Islands, because the Faroe Islands are places where millions of seabirds come all the time, uh, and they've had sheep on them for a long, long time. Um, it's the Faroes is really a, the the Dutch word. Uh, it's a, it's a, protected by Denmark today, 
Um, and uh, it means sheep islands in, in, uh, in Dutch. So I'm, so, uh, I'm sorry, Danish, not Dutch. Um, and it was uh, historically populated by Irish monks um, until the beginning of the Viking era, where they eventually ran them out. So um, anyway, it's a, it's a very, a very uh, famous place for seabirds that like to collect there and, uh, um, and uh, you know, nest and all that. So it's, it's, a, it's a famous place. So the description is certainly of, uh, of the Faroe Islands. So uh, the monks then continued their journey in the story uh, sailing into unknown seas and came to an island where it looked like a great number of blacksmiths were working on glowing metal. So as they watched the metal, it became molten before their eyes, and then they were pelted with uh, flaming, foul-smelling rocks. It was thought that demons threw fiery slag at them. Um, St. Brendan thought this was a depiction of hell and uh, and in fact, one of his crewmen uh, fell overboard at this place and was lost. So um, a lot of people say, well, this has got to be a fictitious place. I mean, what, you know, what would, uh, what would go on with that? You know, so here's a description uh, written by Charles Morris of the Icelandic volcano eruptions. So he talks about um, the cold climate of, of the island, was Iceland, and the height of the mountains produce vast quantities of snow and ice, which covers the volcanoes and fills the cracks and valleys on their side. When an eruption commences, the intense heat of the boiling lava and the steam that rushes from the crater makes a whole mountain hot, and masses of ice and deluges of water roll down the, into the plains. The lava pours from the top and the cracks of the mountain and is ejected hundreds of feet to fall among the ice and snow. And great masses of red hot stone are cast forth, accompanied by cinders and fine ashes that splash into the roaring torrent that tears up rocks and devastates the, the surrounding area for miles. So um, this description um, made in 19... 06 or something of the uh, of the volcanoes in uh, in uh, Iceland duplicate uh, practically what uh, what Saint uh, Saint Brendan um, experienced as he passed this island that he'd called hell it was uh, fiery uh, smelling foul smelling uh, slag was coming down at, at him and. Uh, um, if he had never seen a volcano erupt before, he could very well have mistaken it for hell. So, anyway, so from from this island that uh, it was most likely uh, uh, Iceland, he sailed west for forty days. So, and along the way, they encountered a, a crystal pillar at sea. Um, a lot of people think, well, that, that's got to be fictitious, some crystal pillar. Um, but it turns out they're sailing through the area between Iceland and Greenland that has a north, a strong north to south current flowing through it, and which brings icebergs down from the, from the Arctic. Um, and this is the ac actual area where the Titanic struck the iceberg in 1912. So, um, you know, it would make sense to a... a, a you know, a uh, Irish monk that was used to coming from a warmer climate, that uh, a crystal pillar would look an awful lot like an iceberg. So um, that uh, you know kind of makes sense that it that he was talking about an iceberg that came by. Um, the voyage then sails into an area of darkness, which they decide is a good omen. Well, you know, sailors are aware that. You know, fog at sea is is a is a presence of signi signifies the presence of being near land. So, um, so it could have been a fog on the Newfoundland coast, which is is notorious for its heavy fog there. So, um, the travelers then reached an inhospitable coast where there were creatures with tusks and speckled bellies, which were unfriendly to visitors. So. If you look at the Atlantic uh, walrus, for instance, um, 
that would have an unusual <laughs> creature with tusks. And they have speckled bellies, or the appearance of speckled bellies uh, in, in that species, that particular species of walrus, um, and the, from the skin on their underside. So um, Atlantic walruses were distributed along the Canadian coast from the Arctic all the way down to the St. Lawrence Seaway. So St. Bernard and his fellow monks um, would never have seen such creatures as they're not uh, native to the side of of the Atlantic where he was from, um, which would have been the uh, you know the the Britain side and Ireland side of it. Um, so uh, walruses are very territorial; uh, and they chase people out of any any uh, unfriendly visitor. <laughs> Uh, that in their area they would chase them out uh, and would become aggressive. So that may have been the sign of being unfriendly uh, to visitors. So, so from that island, they, they suggested, they sailed a great distance and it became warmer. Soon they discovered a sluggish sea. Um, well, the Sargasso Sea is an area of an Atlantic uh, down by... Uh, the um, Caribbean that, uh, um, you know, where sargassum is abundant and it's, it turns the sea very sluggish. Um, the tale uh, that was written about St. Brennan also mentions that the uh, water was transparent. Well, you know, most of the Caribbean is, uh, is renowned for its clear, clean waters and, you know, draws scuba divers from all over the world to, to you know, enjoy its clarity so uh saint brendan and uh, in the story saint brendan landed on an island where small dark savages attacked them um could it could it have been carib indians well you know um they would you know they were small and dark you know they certainly were <laughs> um and uh they traveled along and they they, they came across a place um to a great land abounding in apples. Um, now, St. Brendan, coming from Ireland and, and uh, visiting the North Countries, would not know of any fruit other than apples, really, because there was, you know, there were no other, there were no other fruits there. So um, it, no matter what he saw that was growing on trees that uh, looked like uh, fruits, I mean, it could have been, it could have been, uh, something like cherries or something, but, but it was unusual to have any fruit in, in Northern Europe and the British Isles other than apples. So, so he, you know, he may have said apples and been, had been referring to fruit. So, so there was a land before him that was separated by a wide river. So, um, so after uh, exploring this land for some time, they realized the land was so vast that they'd never been able to explore the limits. So St. Brendan and the 12 remaining monks then returned to Ireland. They were gone uh, 14 years. So um, modern researchers and you know uh, people interested in that sort of thing um, have become convinced that this is more than a piece of fiction. Uh, the descriptions are too clear to justify something, you know, that's just a piece of fantasy. Um, so, uh, a, a man named Tim Severin in 1976 set out to prove that such a voyage was possible. So, um, the original 19th uh, century text of the Voyage of St. Brendan contains a detailed description of the Cura that St. Brendan built and how it was made. So, uh, Tim Severin uh, went to Ireland and uh, tried to build a Cura just like uh, St. Brendan's. Um, and he uh, completed a 36-foot-long, 8-foot-wide cura, and it was made of a latticework structure of light ash lashed together with leather thongs and covered with oxide leather stitched together with flax thread and sealed with sheep fat. This was, this was all being done at the time St. Brennan um, made his voyage. So... Um, he uh, had it launched along. He had flax ropes rigged to wooden masts, and, um, and he added some safety gear and radio to call for help. But all the technology in the boat that had to do with its operation um, was no newer than 500 A.D. So, 
So it was in common use for ocean-going boats at the time of St. Brendan. So this, this boat would have had the same capacity as St. Brendan's and was, uh, would be able to transport 14 monks. So on May 17th, 1976, Tim Severn set sail uh, for the New World in his cura, named the Brendan, uh, in honor of the man um, who sailed it there 1,412 years before. So They sailed north past the Hebrides and the rocky uh, St. Kildas Island, uh, St. Brendan's first stop, and then they continued to St. Brendan's Sheep Islands, the Faroes, and continued on to Iceland, where he landed on July 16th. Um, they, they caught uh, fish and birds along the way in the same manner as sailors would have a um, hundred years or a thousand years before. Uh, everything done on the trip was done as closely as possible to the techniques uh, and sailors of St. Brendan's time. Um, the next spring, uh, he took a break to make some repairs and raise some more funds. Um, and uh, on May 7th, 1977, he sailed outward of, from Iceland toward the coast of America. So Saint, like St. Saint Brennan, Saint Tim Severn encountered crystal pillars, floating ice, uh, and had a uh, too close of an encounter with a floating ice that punctured his leather-covered craft. So he actually struck one iceberg and... and uh, and he also encountered uh, dense fog um, as for several days before making landfall. Um, so on June 26, 1977, he landed in Newfoundland off the east coast of Canada. So Tim Severn wrote a book, and it's called The Brendan Voyage, that details the journey from the boat construction times to the expedition and the many challenges it presented. So... So did this remarkable journey prove St. Brendan actually made it to the coast? No, it didn't, but it did prove a leather-skinned boat of the type in common use in St. Brendan's time and using the navigational techniques and materials of the time was capable of making such a journey. This in itself was no small accomplishment, you know, like, like several other modern-day researchers. Tim Severn's determination and daring proved that the theory of crossing the ocean requiring more advanced shipbuilding technology are really unfounded. So um, anyway, uh, a, a person named Creighton E.M. Miller has done uh, considerable research on the ancient methods of navigation. Um, and he has presented evidence in a book that, uh, um, that I bought and read <laughs> uh, that the... Um, uh, Celtic cross or Celtic cross, I guess, is in truth a navigational instrument. So um, he explains that travel by water was much more extensive in ancient times than previously believed and um, because there were no roads back then. So if you traveled, it was by boat, um, either up and down rivers or, or in the ocean. So um, you know, that's why every major city and smaller towns spring up around rivers and, and uh, protected bays and anchorages and that sort of thing. So the, the knowledge of navigational instruments and their usage wasn't just for a few sea captains. Um, it, it was commonplace by travelers like St. Brendan. So... Uh, one, one such instrument, uh, which, which is previously thought an uh, ornamental religious symbol, the, the, this Celtic cross, um, can be used as a measurement of latitude. It's like a sextant because it'll determine the angle of the sun and the local time. So um, it's, it's actually uh, the cross with a circular background is actually the pointing device. Um, so... Uh, its elevation can be read in degrees of how far north you are, for instance. That's the way um, modern celestial navigators do it anyway. They, they, uh, take, they take measurement of the sun's location uh, to calculate the latitude north of, of uh, um, you know, north of the equator or south of the equator, wherever they are. So, um Every drawing depicting St. Brendan uh, that has, has, has come, come down uh, has him uh, carrying a prominent uh, Celtic cross. So it was the same type that uh, 
Creighton Miller used to determine his position. So the monks of the time were educated people, and so he certainly would have been educated and trained on his secrets. So um, th that he may have used that as a navigational instrument that, that made him, allowed him to cross the ocean there. Um, there's a lot of other evidence of St. Brennan's voyage um, could have been uh, something other than, you know, the imagining uh, rantings of a forgotten uh, novelist, you know. So the name of the pharaohs, for instance, uh, the ancient Norse words fair, uh, meaning sheep islands, fair eger, meaning sheep islands. Uh, it was the same name given to it by the Celtic monks. Monks, so the Norse, um, you know, may have uh, named it by being told of its original habit, hab inhabitants. The Irish, Irish monks that were there, described in the voyage of Saint Brendan. Um, anyway, uh, there were there were plenty of sheep there when when Saint Brendan arrived, and uh, um, so diverse, they said it was uh, in the story that it was filled with countless sheep and very many diverse kinds of seabirds. Um, had had Irish monks originally settled it, you know, with their vows of chastity, there's, they would not have had children. So they may not have been replaced and, uh, and you know, the people eventually disappeared and it ended up just being sheep islands. So. Anyway, um, and when the Vikings arrived, uh, was a hundred or more years after St. Brendan would have been there. Um, and then, uh, you know, they had driven off, uh, many other people there. So they, they were, uh, um, you know, there, there, there were no, there were no, no one living there when the, uh, when the Vikings, uh, eventually came. So had they driven them off or killed them or, or they just not been there when the Vikings arrived, then that would have made sense. So. Um, two amateur uh, archaeologists uh, discovered some um, stone petroglyphs in Boone and Wyoming counties of West Virginia. Um, 1970, a geological survey team dis discovered those or studied those uh, carvings, and they decided they were simply carvings of early Indians. We had no particular uh, uh, relevance, um, but they had they had uh, uh, come to an attention of an archaeologist named Robert Pyle about ten years later. Um, he uh, mentioned that it looked similar to old runic writing, um, so they um, they estimated that those carvings had been in the stone between five hundred and eight hundred A.D. So. Um, he began studying the site in 1982 and made 18 visits. Um, eventually, it got the attention of uh, archaeologist Barry Fell. Well, I'm sorry, he was a Harvard marine biologist named Barry Fell um, with a strong interest in linguistics. And um, he uh, described the carvings as old ogham. Uh, ogham was a, uh, was a, was a, a Celtic language. It was inscriptions of, of bars uh, that were cut in the edge of things, and they were uh, different lengths of different lines and that sort of thing. Um, they had um, they had actually discovered a, um, a, a like a um, I forget what you call it. Uh, <laughs> um, they discovered a, a Rosetta stone, let's say, of, of old Ogham because they had written had been written in, uh, along with I, uh, Latin. So they actually had a stone that translated Ogham into Latin. So they were able to determine um, uh, that this Ogham script that uh, that had been located in, in in West Virginia that was from 500 A.D was actually Ogham and Barry Fell uh, translated it and it said <clears throat> it said this a happy time is Christmas a time of joy and goodwill for all people the virgin was um, a virgin was with child God ordained her to conceive and be fruitful ah behold a miracle she gave birth to a son in a cave her foster father gave him the name of Jesus Alpha and Omega festive season of prayer 
um, that was what the Ogham script translated to. Um, and that's 1500 years old in North America. So, and it was written in the, in the writing of the ancient Irish. So, you know, it's, uh, far more believable to think that an Irish monk carved it there than it was the Indians accidentally happened to scratch those Ogham letters into the side of a mountain. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, uh, there were there were actually no uh, there were never any um, any Indian uh, written language that has ever been detected. So um, anyway, so anyway, the other there were other Christian symbols that located on this site: the Cairo monogram symbolizing the name of Christ, and the Dextra Day symbolizing the right hand of a God, also appear with the Roman script. So these were. These were Irish symbols. Uh, they were not carved accidentally by Indians. So, um, Anyway, they argue that those carvings uh, were pretty far inland because they're in West Virginia instead of right along the coast. But uh, the, the Voyage of St. Brendan story talks about journeys of 40 days to explore the limits of the country where they arrived. So um, that's how they decided it was too vast to be explored by their small group, so they gave it up. So it's not difficult to conceive that uh, during the inland explorations, uh, you know, the arrival of Christmas and uh, determined by the measurements made by their Celtic cross prompted these people to leave a Christmas greeting for future visitors to pass. Whatever the reason, the, the evidence clearly points to Celtic visitors engraving stones in West Virginia about the same time St. Brennan was sailing to the mysterious land of the West. So, so did St. Brennan, the abbot, actually cross the Atlantic to visit the shores of America? Well, again, it's difficult to say. The Shawnee Indians have a traditional story uh, of in earlier times when men had uh, iron implements that inhabited Florida. So, St. Brendan's knowledge of animals and plants, such as the walrus, are described in the ancient Latin text, seem to indicate so. You know, we find that the voyage is possible since Tim Severin completed it in the ship just built just like St. Brendan's. So we also know that someone familiar with ancient Irish writing style carved a Christian religious method, complete with symbols in West Virginia about 15 years ago. So if it wasn't St. Brendan, it certainly was someone. Anyway, that's the story of St. Brendan the Abbot. So I hope you enjoyed, and we'll talk to you again soon. Be sure and like and subscribe. And uh, again, thanks for watching.